because there are six and a half million refugees or displaced people in the nation of Syria. Canada's doing their part, bringing in 25,000, but you know what? That's a drop in the bucket. You have two and a half million people in Syria living in UN refugee camps. <laughs>
So then Pastor Keith sat down with the imam, his name was Joseph, and, and Keith explained to him the gospel of Jesus Christ and the message of loving not only your neighbor, not only the stranger, but even your enemy. At the end of the conversation, the Muslim imam of that area, Joseph, gave his heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. How great is that story? Imagine the next weekend as he's standing up in his mosque as a brand new believer. Uh, Keith, of course, pointed out in the Quran where Jesus was. So he says, I'll show you where it is in your book. And he showed him where it was in the Quran so this guy could talk about Jesus. And you see, that's the message of Christianity. Let's never lose sight of the fact that the, the predominant characteristic of Christianity is love. If you take that out, we have no message. If we don't love our, wor our world, if we don't love our neighbor, if we don't love the stranger, if we don't love our enemy, we have nothing, the scripture says, if we do not have love. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to be talking about primarily about the 1040 window, but we're going to be talking about the world in general. And I want you to take a little look at, at this picture of the world. This is a map of the world. This is the status of Christianity today by, by nations. And if you look at the different colors, the green stands for those places that have, have established Christianity. So you see, of course, North America and South America. You see Sub-Saharan Africa. You see Australia and parts of Europe, places like that, where Christianity has, has taken a root in those places. Then there's places where it's in the formative or nominal state. And those are the yellow ones. So you see much of Russia and a few different places. And then there's the unreached world. And the unreached world is what we call the 1040 window. And it's, it's 10 degrees north by 40 degrees north, uh, stripped through Africa and Asia. And you can see those northern Saharan uh, countries in Africa. And uh, this is a tremendous area of the world, the 1040 window that we're going to talk about in a minute. But there's 7 billion plus people in the world now. That's what the population has now hit. 2.87 billion of those people have never heard the gospel, gospel of Jesus Christ. That's, that's a third of the world has never heard this message. We, we, we need to give them something to talk about. And that thing is the love of Jesus. And we need to somehow get that message to them. Now I'm going to show you some good news. Here's another map, and this is what's happening in the world right now as far as the growth of Christianity. And it's a little bit different. I'll tell you what, how it works. The, the, the orange or brown there, those are countries where evangelical Christians, and that's what we're talking about for this discussion. I'm not talking primarily about Catholicism or some of those things. But as far as evangelical Christians, we are seeing that there are some nations in the world where their actual number is dropping. Never mind percentage. Their actual number is dropping. So there are nations like Sweden, nations like Finland. You can see Japan over there. And so these countries are in tremendous decrease. But then there's the yellow countries... And this is a little bit indicting because these are places where evangelical Christianity is not keeping up. Though it's growing, it's not keeping up with the growth in population. And do you notice something suspicious about where you live? Canada and the U.S. and Great Britain and some of these countries that would have been Christian countries or known as Christian countries are now become post-Christian countries. And so that's a little bit discouraging. But the good news is this. Look at the rest of the world. These are all places where the growth of Christianity is actually outstripping the growth of population in those countries. So whether they're reached or unreached countries, we are very excited to see something very positive happening. So let's go one, back, one more time back to the 1040 window. I want to just explain this part of the world to you. I mentioned where it is, 10 degrees by 40 degrees north through Africa and Asia. This is where 50% of the world's population lives in the 1040 window. 80% of the world's poverty. 93% of the unreached peoples in the world are in the 1040 window. 93%. Did you catch that? Guess how much of the missions budget of the church worldwide goes to the 1040 window? 7%. That's an inverse proportion. 93% of the people, 7% of the missions budget. There's something wrong with this picture. And not only that, only 3% of the missionaries deployed throughout the world, only 3% of them actually go to the 1040 window. So we made a decision about 10 years ago, and we thought we're not willing to stand idly by and to see this part of the world go unreached. And we're, we're going to do something, we need to do something, and we have committed by, by far the majority of our missions budget actually goes to the 1040 window. It will be somewhere in the range of about $350,000 this year. 
Half of it we're going to raise today. Aren't you excited about that? $175,000 comes in during our pie auction. Then there's other monies that we take out of general budget, other money that people give throughout the year. But the vast majority of our missions dollars are going to go to this 1040 window. You say, why are you so passionate about this? Why do you care about them? I'll tell you why. Because Jesus said this, Matthew chapter 24. He said, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all nations. And then the end shall come. People always talk about the coming of Christ, the return of Christ. I've got news for you. There is no other sign of the return of Christ other than this one that all nations will have a chance to hear the gospel. There's a tremendous amount of work. There's no other sign. Don't, when you think about the return of Christ and the signs of the return of Christ, it is not Israel. It has nothing to do with Israel. It has nothing to do with Iraq. It has nothing to do with Iran. It has nothing to do with blood moons or blood pudding or blood sausage or, you know, farmer sausage or, or tapioca pudding. It has nothing to do with any of those things. It has to do with the message of the gospel going to all nations. And then the end shall come. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about our journey and what we're doing as a church. I'm going to be kind of racing through this, and I apologize for giving you as much information as I'm going to give you this morning and not elaborating on it. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick one story, and I'm going to, and I'm going to sort of give you a nice snapshot of, the, of what's going on in that one nation. But let's begin. Let's fly into the, uh, into the 1040 window here. And the first nation we're going to look at, one that's in the news quite a bit these days, and it's the nation of Syria. And of course, we're all watching this, we're all listening to this, we're all concerned about this, because there are six and a half million refugees or displaced people in the nation of Syria. Canada's doing their part, bringing in 25,000, but you know what? That's a drop in the bucket. You have two and a half million people in Syria living in UN refugee camps. You've seen these pictures, and they just go on for miles after miles of these tents. And what's happened is the, the, the Arab Christians in Syria have actually got permission to go into these refugee camps freely and to preach the gospel and to bring Christian literature. And they said, but we need help. We have all these people that are totally disillusioned by ISIS, totally disillusioned by Islam. They see how this is ruining and destroying their country and they're open, there's this openness to them. And so they, the Christians came and they said, we need seven hundred thousand Bibles. We need for one, one for every home. And so we looked at that and we thought at a dollar a piece we could take on 60,000. So we're taking on 60,000 Bibles to the Syrian refugees so that they would have an opportunity irrespective of their particular living situations. They still need to hear about the love of God that someone cares about them and someone cares enough about them to get them the word of God because the word of God can change you from the inside out even if everything around you looks dreadful. So that's our first nation, Syria. <laughs> Jesus said this, this gospel of the, God, of the kingdom will be preached to all nations. All nations. And, the, and it wasn't political nations, it's the word ethne, where we get our word ethnic from. And when Jesus was referring to the gospel being preached to all nations, he was talking about ethno-linguistic groups. That's what a nation was in, 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 in biblical understanding. And there are 16,500 ethno-linguistic groups, people who have their own culture and their own language and their own dialect, and uh, some of them are very remote. And here's the, the hardest part to, to imagine, that 2,000 years after the coming of Christ, there's six, still 6,500 people groups that, that don't have a credible witness of the gospel. They call them unreached peoples. And out of those 6,500 of them, 2,500 of them don't even have a Bible in their own language. And when we heard that, we thought, this is tragic. In the, in, in the 21st century, that there's 2,500 people groups that don't even have a Bible that they can read? We thought, this is tragic. And so we partnered with this, this organization called One Book Canada. They work with nationals and unreached people groups all over the world. And over the years, we have adopted five people groups. And we've taken on five. We, we had one that we are retired already in Ethiopia, the, uh, or uh, uh, Uganda, rather, the Aringa people, and that one's already completed. Uh, we picked it up partway through it. But there's these other five, and I want to just quickly run through them, just remind you of them, because they're pretty exciting projects. The, the first one is in Kenya. It's just outside the 1040 window, but there's a great need there. And there's an unreached people group there called the Wata people. These people are incredibly poor. They're illiterate. Part of the problem with being illiterate is you usually stay poor because you get taken advantage of. And so they have an oral language, but they don't have a written language. 
And you folks are 100% sponsoring the translation, actually the production of a written language. So what happens is their language, uh, an alphabet gets formed, and out of the alphabet, a written language gets formed, and then eventually the scriptures. There'll be literacy programs that'll go with this. This people, the Wata people in Kenya, will be transformed by what you do to help. So let's move on to the next unreached people group, and uh, they, they would be in the nation of Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso is the fourth poorest nation in the world. Again, the particular people that we're working with, the Pujuli people, they are uh, illiterate. You can see their, their alphabet getting developed there. They're getting a, a, a written language out of their oral language. They're getting an alphabet. They're getting literacy programs. And uh, these incredibly poor people are going to have their lives transformed. Moving on, we're going to the nation of India. We have two projects in India. Uh, it's amazing to me that in today's day and age, with as advanced as India is, which it really is, as old and as much culture and being a British colony, the fact that there's still unreached peoples in India that haven't heard the gospel and don't have the, the word of God in their own language is incredible. So we've taken on these two projects, the Duco project and the Gurija project. And so the last one I want to look at, and I'm pretty excited about this one, is the nation of Nepal. And they, the reason I'm excited about this one is, is we were, this was our first unreached people group. Some of you remember this. Uh, it was about eight or nine years ago we uh, agreed to sponsor this project, so we started it. We were the first ones. And we're going to be riding this one through from beginning to the very, very end. And the, and the Chemku people, they live right at the base of the Himalayas is where they live. And uh, they're getting this, this Bible, and they've already got, last year they got the Book of Luke. But in May of this year, they will be getting and presented and dedicated to them their brand new Bible in their own language, one year ahead of schedule because of what you did. Now, they, they are so, they're so excited about this and so excited about what you did to sponsor this project, they know that you're their sponsors, that they invited me to come and to be there as part of the dedication. So Kathy and I are going in May, and we're going to be there, and I'm going to do a, a pastor's conference for them as they gather, and we're going to be there for part of this great celebration of having their brand new scriptures presented to them. I just can't hardly wait. Uh, to do that. Because they're at the base of the, of the Himalayas, probably Kathy and I will take a day and run up Mount Everest. <laughs> and uh, you don't want to see the sights. This is an actual, it's climbing season. May is climbing season. This is an actual picture of the climbing season in May going up the side of Mount Everest. There's like a traffic jam on Mount Everest. Everybody does it. That's the peak. They're going up to the summit. Some are coming up, some are going up, down. I, I'm thinking, why are these people so anxious? Well, there's a reason why. Look at this next picture. It's the only McDonald's. <laughs> the only McDonald's in all, all of Nepal is on the summit of Mount Everest. And so we'll probably run up there and get a Big Mac and, and a milkshake and enjoy the sight. So that's what our plan is for when we go. I want, one, I want to talk about one more nation with you in, in closing here, and it's the nation of, of, of Ethiopia. I don't have time to tell you a lot of stories uh, because we're racing through so many different countries, but I always like to take one and feature it and tell a little bit of a story about it. So I'm going to tell you the story about Ethiopia. It's right on the edge of the 1040 window. And what's fascinating about Ethiopia is its biblical history goes way back. And we can actually see the start of this thing. It's in Acts chapter 8, and we're going to go look at it. And uh, we're going to see a little bit of their Christian history, and we can find out a lot just from reading the scriptures about Ethiopia. And then I'm going to tell you what's going on there right now and it's going to blow your mind. And so Acts chapter 8, verse 26 says this, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south along the road which goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he rose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, there it is, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge over all her treasury, he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And was returning and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah, the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake the chariot. A couple of things. First of all, this, this is a 1040 window story. It's taking place in, in the area outside of Jerusalem. And it also is, he's on his way to Ethiopia. So it's a 1040 story. And so here we look at this picture. You say, why, wait a minute, why was this Ethiopian... Why was he in Jerusalem? It says he came there to worship. 
Now here's the reason behind this. Some of you will remember that in the days of King Solomon, when he was in the height of his glory, there was a queen that came and visited him. And her name was the Queen of Sheba. And she was actually the queen of Ethiopia. And she came and what she saw took her breath away. And she wanted to know all about King Solomon's God. And what she did was she took Judaism back to Ethiopia some 3,000 years ago. The oldest Jewish community outside of Israel in the world today is actually in Ethiopia. And it goes all the way back to the Queen of Sheba and King Solomon. Now understand that the Jews there are, are actually Ethiopian Jews. They're, they're black Jews. They're not Greenbergs and Steinbergs and Icebergs and, you know, whatever. Th these are Ethiopian Jews that have uh, come into their faith centuries and centuries ago. So now you understand why this Ethiopian, he was a man of, of means, right? Because he was the treasurer under Queen, Queen Candace. So he had wherewithal financially to be able to go to Jerusalem and worship in Jerusalem every year is what he was doing. So here we have, he had just finished worshiping Jerusalem. He was on his way back to Ethiopia, which is a very long chariot ride. And so if you following this story, he's got a driver. He's not driving the chariot on his own. He's got a driver, and he's sitting in the chariot, and he happens to be reading the book of Isaiah. So God chooses Philip, who's one of the former deacons of the Jerusalem church, and he speaks to him. He says, I want you to go out in the desert. So he goes out in the desert. He's standing out there. All he sees is a chariot going by. And the Spirit of the Lord speaks to him and says, overtake the chariot. Now I have a question for you. How's he going to overtake the chariot? He's going to have to run. And so I'm wondering if you're imagining this picture. The chariot's going across the desert. And Philip's <laughs> running after him, trying to catch up to him. So he runs up to him. And the conversation that they have next that we're going to jump over, uh, but I'll explain it to you. They have, well, he's running beside him. And he's running along beside him, talking to him. Hi, Philip's my name. What's yours? Uh, eunuch, hi, eunuch. Uh, he, and he says, he says, do you understand what you're reading? He says, this is what he said. He said, how can I understand if no one tells me? You see, he was open, wasn't he? But he didn't know. It wasn't like he was close to it. He just didn't know. And he's reading from the book of Isaiah. And so this chariot stops, because Philip was getting tired. And he invites him onto the chariot. And they carry on down the road. And imagine this picture. Philip and this eunuch are sitting in the chariot, going through the desert, having this conversation. And he's asking about the book of Isaiah. And he's asking this story in Isaiah. Is it about himself or is it about someone else? Picking this up. Verse... 36, no, verse, verse 35 says, Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to them. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, listen to this, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. Both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. Now when they had come out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more and he went on his way rejoicing. I'm, I'm wondering if you caught this. We see God moving all heaven and earth to be able to bring the gospel to this one man. To this one man. You see, that's what this is all about. What is, what is one soul worth? What is one man's or one woman's or one child's spiritual well-being worth? And God speaks to Philip, who had an important job, was this great evangelist in Samaria and Jerusalem. He says, go to the desert. I've got a project for you. He gets him out in the middle of the desert. Now he's getting further and further away because he's on a chariot ride. So then when they finish the baptism, it says the Lord caught him away. And he disappeared. The eunuch's going, cool. I mean, that, so God moved heaven and earth. So the eunuch returns to Ethiopia and becomes the first Christian in Ethiopia. So Ethiopia has this immense Christian history. But what happens oftentimes in these nations is what began very uh, vigorously oftentimes secedes. And 30 years ago, there was zero evangelical Christians in Ethiopia. Zero. But you know what's happened in the last 30 years? There has been 20 million 
people come to Christ in the nation of Ethiopia in the last 30 years. 20% of the population, the 100 million, 20% of them are Christians in the last 30 years. There's been this absolute explosion of the gospel in this place. So this is what happened. We got a call from some people. They were doing a project and they were train, training 550 pastors, church planters. And they said, we're going to send these people out, 550 of them. We're going to send them out and their job is to plant churches in Ethiopia, but we need somebody to sponsor them. We said, how much do you need? They said, we need $50 a month. For $50 a month, we can support a, a pastor and his entire family for $50 a month. So they sent, I don't know if we had this picture up yet. Have we seen this? Here's, here's these 550 pastors. They're being trained in this school of ministry. And when they're done, this is their charge. Their charge is to go out and not plant one, not plant two, not plant uh, two, but three churches there to plant. And, and in the next couple of years. And so this is what a typical church plant looks like. One of these men will go out and uh, play spot the pastor. He'd be the one with the suit and tie, right? And, uh, of course, the, his Bible in a nice, beautiful carrying bag. And so he's the pastor, and he will go out on $50 a month. This guy's planting a church. So we said, we'll take 50. We said, we'll take 50 of these. We'll sponsor. There were sponsorships for different ones. We said, we'll take 50 of these, these church planters. And so then, a year later... I wanted to know how it went, and I wanted to know the exact truth. I wanted to know the exact numbers, so I phoned them. And I phoned them this week, and I said, I want to know what's happened. What's happened with these 550, and what's happened with our 50 in particular? Not, not that it's separated from the rest of the group. This is what they told me. They said, well, these pastors did not go out and plant three churches each. They went out and planted five each. They said the average guy planted five, and the, and the average church is 300 people. I want you to do the math on this. For, we, we sponsored 50 pastors at $50 a, a, a month. Uh, that's all we're paying. We have seen, do the math on this. How many churches is that? 50 pastors times five, 250 churches, right? The average church is 300 people. Do the math on this. How many people? 75,000 people came to Christ in this last year because of what you did in this pie auction. 75,000 people. I said, I don't want to tell this story if it's not true. And I talked to the guy who had been there. He just returned from Ethiopia. And he was telling me, he said, no, this is what's happening. He says, the average church that they're planning is 300, 300 people. It's just booming, booming. Now, I want you to personalize this for a moment. Because maybe you come to this pie auction and, and you, you buy a pie. You buy banana cream pie for $600. That's what they were selling for this morning, the banana cream pies. They were the cheap ones. And you pay $600 for a banana cream pie. You say, that's a very reasonable price. Wouldn't you say that for <laughs> banana cream pie? A pretty good price, I think. But I want you to think about this. You know what that does? That sponsors one pastor for one year at $50 a month. That's $600. That one pie will actually plant flat five churches of 300 people each. That's 1,500 people are going to come to Christ for your $600 pie. Don't you want a pie? Yeah. You want to buy a pie today. You want to buy a pie. You see, we have this great opportunity to touch our world. There are things happening that are mind-boggling and phenomenal, and we have the easy part. All we have to do is step up and give some money, and in doing so, we can give them something to talk about. So how many of you are with me that we need to step out and we need to raise some big money today and let's give them something to talk about. Talk about love. Amen? Hello, Mark Hughes here from Church of the Rock. What you're seeing on the screen is some of the amazing creations from the pie auction. 2300 years ago, 2300. One pie Don't sold for an incredible $5,200. Don't 52 and a half. Of course, no pie is worth that kind of money. That's not what it's about. It's about giving towards missions in the 1040 window. Speaking of which, I want to thank all of you who were part of it last year and partnered with us and give you another opportunity this year to partner again. Everything you give, 100%, will go to buy Bibles and advance the gospel in the 1040 window. So here's what you need to do. Go to our website, find Donate Online, click on the 1040 window, and we'll make sure everything you give without taking any administrative costs will go to advance the gospel around the world. God bless, and let's build the kingdom of God together.